Thank you, um, first to the PBL for the invitation and also to Timo Maas for um, the introduction and um, yeah, making the connection between my work and, and uh, the topic of the symposium. Uh, it's a shame I can't be there with you in person, uh, but I'm all the more grateful that, that you can facilitate my, my participation in, in this other way. What I would like to do in my talk is give you a view from the United Kingdom on this question of contested knowledge and in particular the public contestation of knowledge. Now, of course, as a, as a Dutch person in uh, Great Britain, I cannot help notice uh, that the UK is quite an outlier at the moment when it comes to these issues. Uh, but I'm still hoping that um, yeah, the, the, the controversies uh, and the contestations that we're living through here in the UK, that, uh, that they have wider, wider relevance um, to you. So um, the first slide, please. Yes, so the, this is the one. The point where I would like to start is this, that knowledge, uh, and in particular scientific knowledge, is con contested on multiple fronts in multiple domains at the moment. And I believe that this multiplicity of contestations of knowledge is key to understanding uh, the challenges we face. So the case of uh, the science and knowledge of COVID-19 can serve as an instructive case in this regard. In the United Kingdom, um, independent scientists were brought together into a advisory group uh, at the start, early on in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, they were called SAGE, the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies. But their advice was contested, uh, including by uh, important figures in government themselves. In itself. So a uh, few months back, Rishi Sunak, who at the time uh, was a secretary, um, he um, made the public statement that he thought it was a mistake that scientists had been empowered uh, to the extent that they were uh, to advise the government um, during the pandemic. So science contested or the role of science contested by leading figures in government. At the same time, scientists uh, during the unfolding COVID-19 pandemic were engaged in controversies with publics about science and knowledge. So here in the middle of my slide, you see a tweet by Trish Greenhall, who is a renowned expert in primary health care, um, who did a lot of work on vaccine safety and communicating um, the, the evidence on the, on the question of vaccine safety, which was a big issue of public debate in the UK. Lastly, science and scientists are facing challenges and contestations from the media. And sometimes this takes uh, quite personal forms. So here on the right, uh, you see a news item or a, rather a digital media news item featuring Susan Mitchie, behavioral scientist and currently heading um, a, a advisory group at the World Health Organization. And in the media, critical pieces appeared quite consistently um, including uh, focusing on her politics, um, noting that she, um, she, she's a communist or she's a member of the Communist Party. Could we move to the next slide? Now, interpreting and evaluating these kinds of contestations of science in public in the UK is an ongoing process and many scientists, academics and journalists are involved in this process of, of interpreting the public contestation of science and what challenges it poses. However, in the context of this symposium, what I believe is striking about these various contestations is that they differ in several respects from what I have learned are classic cases of the public contestation of knowledge from previous decades. So in the late 90s, 
one of the defining um, uh, public controversies of si about science was, the, was a controversy that focused on genetically modified foods and genetically modified crops and the question of whether they were safe. Now, when, when we consider those debates, those earlier debates, we can see that there too, the contestation of science uh, in public took, was a central uh, component of the controversy and uh, including some of the issues around, uh, for instance, critical media reporting on science, they also featured prominently in those controversies. But when we look at the type of actors and the forms of disagreement, I think we can note some important differences between then and now. So in the late 90s and early 2000s, it was possible to uh, conceive of public controversies about science in terms of what we then called issue networks. Networks of scientific organizations, professional bodies and activist organizations who take position on a specific knowledge claim, is GM food safe and mobilize evidence in the contestation of that knowledge claim. When we look at contemporary debates about the safety of um, COVID-19 vaccines, a quite different picture emerges. First, the type of organizations that are involved in the contestation of, of this claim, um, which includes a much broader ar array of small uh, grassroots organizations that take on the role of the representative of the public. And in these cases, it's not necessarily that evidence is mobilized to, to contest a knowledge claim. Rather, the dispute includes a notable element uh, which takes the form of attacks on the scientific consensus and sometimes um, attacks on what it gets referred to as scientific orthodoxy. Could we go to the next slide? Now, one of the ways in which we can think through these differences uh, among paradigmatic cases uh, as, as we are um, uh, learning to understand them is that in the knowledge controversies um, that I and, and I think others too got used to uh, in our uh, science and technology intensive societies, there was a focus on contested knowledge in the er late 90s and uh, earlier 2000s. So here we found disagreement about new knowledge claims within what uh, has been called an extended peer community. So these are communities of experts, professionals and activists who have a stake in the issue, but we are committed, but who are committed to genuine debate. And I would also add the mobilization of evidence. Well, I think what we're finding today is that we're increasingly um, uh, need to come to terms with what not contested knowledge, but contentious knowledge. So representatives of the public who do not so much mobilize evidence to contest specific knowledge claims, but rather seek to dispute the scientific consensus. And indeed, you might wonder, the very centrality of knowledge uh, to public debate uh, on, on current affairs. So this distinction is one that I offer not as a given, but as uh, yeah, a distinction that, that we need to interrogate um, further. Um, I think it is probably safe to say that these different types of contesting knowledge have coexisted uh, across many different societies and historical periods. These types of forms of knowledge contestation have both been in play. Um, but one question that we may ask is whether today the latter uh, is, is gaining more prominence uh, um, than um, was the case in previous decades.
Now, this is not a question that I will attempt to empirically uh, uh, sort of settle for you. What I would like to do instead is um, take you on a bit of a, an exploration of the following slightly different question, which is what difference does it make to how we understand the relation between science and its publics and science and society if we focus on contentious knowledge rather than on contested knowledge. So what difference does it make that uh, we have increasingly, if that is the case, uh, to deal with uh, contentious uh, knowledge? Next slide, please. As Timo Maas mentioned uh, in his introduction, I have made some steps towards answering this question uh, in an essay that got published a few years ago called Why We Can't Have Our Facts Back. And in this essay, I reflect on the rise of fact checking um, as well as a wider um, sort of retopicalization of the distinction between what counts as fact and what doesn't count as fact. So the fact, non-fact distinction, uh, as well as the notion that was invoked earlier on of alternative facts. Now, at the time, so this is the, uh, this is around five, uh, five years ago, um, definitely before we entered the, the period of, of, of pandemic. Um, and around uh, in the UK, the, around the time of the Brexit debates. What could be observed then was the growth uh, of uh, services focused on providing fact checks to media and news organizations. So here you see uh, the Office of Full Fact, which is an uh, organization based in London, which is partly funded uh, by the tech industry and which provides this service of checking public statements, both statements made by uh, politicians and leading me le media figures to, um, yeah, to, to really intervene in the flow, the free flow of what was then called um, fake news. Now, at this time, uh, fact-checking, so forward five years uh, to the present, fact-checking has become quite a familiar feature of the me media landscape, at least seen from the, from the, from the English-speaking world. So both newspapers like the New York Times have their own in-house fact-checking services, which uh, frequently uh, feature um, in their reporting. Um, but also uh, uh, the big uh, tech companies themselves uh, now work with fact-checking services uh, to, to sort of monitor and moderate uh, content on, on platforms like, like Facebook. Now, fact-checking, I propose in this essay, can be understood as a wider effort to assert, to reassert the distinction between facts and non-facts um, and to use this distinction between fact and non-fact as a way of dealing with the rise of dodgy and sometimes indeed harmful forms of public discourse. So the type of discourse that does not mobilize evidence but um, yeah, uh, targets um, uh, uh, the role of evidence in, in public debate. Now, in my essay uh, five years ago, I argued that this attempt to reassert this distinction between fact and non-fact was not likely to be successful. Um, and that indeed that this attempt to reassert this distinction um, is in some way, ways misguided in so far as it fails to address and fails to direct attention to wider and deeper transformations of knowledge culture in digital societies. So I'd like to say a little bit about um, this, uh, yeah, how I understand these, this, these kind of problems with no knowledge cultures as they become apparent uh, when we, through the prism of, of fact-checking, and then uh, proceed with a further uh, development of the argument, 
why fact non fact is a distinction that can't save us from the situation and why we need a different type of distinction. So next slide, please. So how can we look at fact checking to learn a bit more about what are the problems with the return to this fact non fact distinction in dealing with uh, the yeah our, our, our problems with 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 knowledge in 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 public discourse. Now, one of the um, when you are interested in the public contestation of knowledge, one of the things that can be very helpful is that sometimes contestations erupt. Uh, in the media that that make clear points that you have been thinking about, and I think this this it's really I think fair for me to say that this happens in the case of fact checking, because in the last few years there have been a lot of um, sort of trouble and friction caused uh, by fact checking. So um, uh, last year the British Medical Journal uh, was fact checked by Facebook and got the sticker uh, partially false tagged onto uh, a scientific article that had gone through the vetting of peer review by this um, yeah, prestigious um, medical journal. So um, the uh, research by the British Medical Journal um, questioned uh, based on evidence, uh, the clinical trial practices of uh, some of the companies had been involved in uh, trialing the Pfizer vaccine. Um, and when this research later quoted on Facebook, it got tagged by Facebook as false. Now, this kind of, uh, and, and subsequently the, the British Medical Journal then took issue with this and published an editorial which showed how uh, their, their science was uh, in effect being censored by Facebook. Now, there are many other organizations that have criticized Facebook on this count, including right wing media uh, that are sort of part of those vaccine networks that I showed you. Um, so uh, organizations that questioned uh, the World Health Organization's reporting, for instance, on the uh, report on the claim that uh, COVID uh, may have uh, originated in a laboratory in Wuhan. Criticism of that WO report got um, tagged on Facebook as false. Um, and what follows then is these allegations of censorship. Uh, so that, that, that public's uh, engagements with knowledge in public debate are censored now by the powers that be in this case, uh, that would be Facebook. Now, it shows, I think, a ki the kind of a backlash that you can get when you uh, mobilize these, uh, the kind of purist uh, concept of what is true knowledge um, to, to uh, police uh, public discourse. A more specific, and I think in the long term also more important problem with fact checking is that it assumes a, a very narrow focus on truths and truth claims that have stability. So fact checking and the fact non fact distinction works when we are talking about claims that are settled, uh, of, about which there is a lot of evidence uh, already available and a consensus has been reached. But many of the claims uh, that are at stake in the knowledge controversies that I just invoked are precisely focused on claims that aren't quite settled is GM food safe? Are the vaccines safe? And so in a way there's a, a misfit between the type of knowledge that is contested in public debate and the conceptual apparatus that gets mobilized, namely the fact non-fact distinction in dealing with it. A further problem that I address in that article, but which we may need to discuss, um, is that fact, the non-fact fact um, distinction relies on a kind of a passive conception of the public. So one could say it, it um, mobilizes a kind of a broadcast model of truth. Uh, so facts need to be communicated towards publics 
Um, but what does not get recognized is that publics are increasingly participants in the creation uh, of public uh, discourse. So there we might also see a kind of a mismatch between fact checking and um, the, yeah, the, the digital, um, uh, digital knowledge spaces or digital public knowledge environments, um, which I hope we, we will be able uh, to, to discuss as well, the question of the knowledge environment. Um, so where does this lead us? Next slide, please. Um, I think rather than a return to the fact, non-fact distinction uh, and its colliery of the distinction between science and ignorance, rather than relying on that opposition, I think we need to set ourselves a more challenging task. And this is to recognize that the project of the knowledge society, the creation and the cultivation of a knowledge society, that this is an unfinished project. So as publics and um, media organizations and a range of professional organizations gain a more uh, prominent role and gain more agency as participants in debates about questions that have a significant knowledge dimension, we are learning and observing to what extent our public culture is not fit for purpose. And that's not because our public culture is bad in all respect. It's because public culture is taking on new roles and therefore also new um, gaining new capacities that it didn't have before. So there are other underlying problems of public knowledge culture in our digital societies, which stem from the fact that the knowledge society is, it is, it is developing, it's coming into existence, but it's doing so in very un impartial uh, and uh, deeply imperfect ways. So it's a shift of perspective there in quite a broad sense that I'm proposing. Now, what happens if we um, shift perspective in this way? I will argue that it's a different uh, distinction rather than fact, non-fact or knowledge ignorance that we will need to uh, develop. We will need to develop different, different concepts, different ways of understanding the situation. And I will um, now show you two um, studies of knowledge controversies that do some of that work of developing a different way of understanding uh, the public contest contestation of knowledge uh, before then concluding with, with a sort of a conceptual summary of what, what is that different ID. So first, uh, next slide. So the first case to think with, if we try to understand what, how does contentious knowledge work as opposed to contested knowledge? So the kind of knowledge where, uh, the, the kind of contestation where, where knowledge itself is put at stake and, and our knowledge culture is put at stake. The first set of uh, cases comes from a uh, ongoing research project called Shaping AI, um, which is a international research project that I'm connected, conducting with colleagues uh, in, in four different countries, including France and Germany, Germany on controversies about arti artificial intelligence in the last 10 years. Now, as part of this study, um, we are conducting some analysis of public controversies about AI on, in social media, including on Twitter. And the controversy I wanted to show you is one um, that uh, is concerned with large language models. Um, so here you see in purple, hopefully you can see this, large language models, uh, and you see that this controversy has been 
uh, running since, uh, I mean, for me, the image isn't very clear, but I hope I am right when I say that is since um, the mid 20s. So it's a recent controversy. Next slide, please. Now, in this particular controversy, um, there is a mixture of, uh, of issues at stake. So this con the controversy about, about large language models um, has many iterations and is taking place in many different fora. But one of the controversies has focused on the work of Timnit Gebru who is a computer scientist who used to work at Google and who wrote a paper together with uh, a colleague, a linguist, Emily Bender, which um, is uh, a paper that refers to large language models as stochastic parrots. And it's a critique of uh, the type of predictive ling uh, language analytics that is being developed uh, both by computer scientists and in big um, tech companies. And in particularly, it challenges the reliance on uh, deep learning methodologies, uh, which involves the training of very complex models uh, on large data sets um, that are uh, sourced from the World Wide Web. Now, when uh, Bender and Gebru um, wrote this paper, they um, basically got involved in a conflict with Gebru's employer, Google, who then proceeded to dismiss or fire Timnit Gebru, which generated a lot of media attention. But at the same time, the paper uh, on stochastic parrots uh, that uh, was the, the, at the heart of this uh, dismissal was leaked um, to the public and so became the focus of a controversy on Twitter where computer scientists, AI ethicists and many others debated the merits of the knowledge claims that Tim Newt Gebru and her colleague uh, Emily Bender put forward about the problems with the methodologies underlying large language models. Uh, next slide, please. So in our um, analysis of this controversy, we have been analyzing uh, conversations on Twitter. So relying on the uh, academic API from Twitter, which allows for longitudinal uh, data collection, we uh, captured all the conversations that mentioned the stochastic parrot paper and did a uh, topic detection analysis where we identified what are the objects of concern that are thematized in these Twitter conversations about the stochastic parrot paper. And what you see here is a figure um, which shows um, different, um, it's, it shows you the, 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 the controversy about stochastic parrots over time, and it shows you the volume um, of tweets um, within uh, particular conversations, and then the topics uh, that featured prominently in those conversations. Now, what was very interesting for me is to see how wide ranging the controversy about uh, large language models became in this discussion about the Stochastic Parrots paper. So you see here that there were definitely um, many conversations that focused on the questions of the biases of models, uh, on um, peer review and uh, the role of peer review in um, uh, sort of uh, ensuring quality control within uh, uh, scientific research conducted in commercial organizations. But you also see that there was wider debates about science and politics and corporate research culture and corporate power. So here um, I'm referring to conversations that uh, raise the point that when 
um, Tim Neat Gabriel wrote a paper that was critical about the methodology underlying large language models that she was in effect silenced by her employer. And what are the consequences for academic freedom and for research um, if um, science um, produced in commercial contexts uh, gets yeah gets influenced uh, and indeed dominated by these kind of uh, dynamics of, of, of corporate research culture. Uh, next slide, please. So um, in this analysis, I'll just quickly show you, we are also looking at what is the level of contestation uh, in these different Twitter conversations. Uh, so uh, size is again, um, uh, the volume of tweets and the color is uh, the, the sort of the level of contention uh, within the conversations uh, that have the, the topic uh, assigned. And you see um, that this, this controversy about large language models very much also includes contestation over, um, uh, again, the issues I uh, mentioned. Uh, so around corporate power, around political bias in, in scientific research conducted in commercial organizations. Uh, next slide. Now, while this research is of course on, ongoing and this analysis is um, not uh, ready, what I think is striking about this controversy and important to recognize is that the, the knowledge controversy here is not primarily concerned with facts or non-facts, with evidence for what, uh, what is true or not. Rather, the controversy focuses on core issues at the intersection of science and politics. So experts here debate bias. They debate the role of interests in knowledge formation in scientific research institutions. They debate the um, distinction uh, and the relation between research and advocacy. So you see that uh, the questions of knowledge culture aren't just something that we as analysts uh, can bring uh, to the table when we talk about contested knowledge. I think it's very much, uh, um, it's that it's very important to recognize that as part of contemporary controversies about knowledge, knowledge culture itself is the focus of debate. And the question for us is, I think, how can we develop a kind of an affirmative strategy in engaging with that focus on, 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 on knowledge and the relation between knowledge and politics itself. So I'm gonna go a little uh, more quickly. Um, so I will on the, um, on the last slide, yeah, on the next slide, please. I have a second case, but I will not say too much about this because I think I have to be careful about our timing. Um, but this case is um, this, a social study that I'm currently conducting of independent SAGE, um, which is a the follow-up, if you will, of SAGE, the organization I mentioned at the beginning, um, which was established um, in uh, June or May 2020 um, as a group of experts uh, who was committed to provide independent scientific advice to the UK government uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, it's important to note that many of the members of, of independent SAGE are also members of SAGE. Um, so the expert advisory group uh, created by the government. And Independent Sage formed with a specific mandate and focus uh, on informing the public uh, about the science of COVID-19. And I want to cite just two um, statements by members of Independent Sage about why they took this step. Uh, to give you a sense of their approach to, um, you know, the role of science in, in, in public life uh, today. So next slide, please. 
So here um, I have included a quote from an interview with a, a member of uh, Independent Sage who narrates uh, how the group came to be. So this scientist used to be part of SAGE, uh, so the scientific advisory group in times of emergency, back in 2009, so quite a long time ago, when one of the first SAGEs was convened by the British government to advise on the bird flu pandemic. And this scientist makes a contrast with that advisory group and what happened at the start of COVID-19. So he says, during um, when, when SAGE was convened to advise the government on COVID-19, SAGE became, was suddenly a far more political structure where previously they had primar primarily uh, engaged with scientific civil servants. They now um, were uh, engaging and interacting with not with civil servants, but government advisors. And you know, personal political advisors who would also join the independent sage uh, meetings which had been completely in common before that so clearly sage was taking a different perspective than what had gone on before and that was what we were really concerned with next slide So independent sage then uh, took it upon themselves to inform the public about the science uh, of, of COVID-19. And they did this primarily in the form of weekly briefings where they invited scientists to both present and comment on um, the latest uh, data uh, and the latest scientific insights uh, in relation to how the pandemic was unfolding in the UK. Now, why did scientists make this investment of time and effort of communicating to the public every Friday afternoon uh, for about 90 minutes? Now here, of the, one of the members of Independent Sage notes that what they really cared about was explaining the public about the uncertainty, the inherent uncertainty of the situation, that the scientists were, were, were giving their best answer at that time. So here, Independent Sage um, made it its task to communicate science to the public at a time where the scientific uh, knowledge base was changing all the time. And so that they took it, also defined it as their task to communicate to the public that when opinions change of scientists, that doesn't mean that they don't know what they're talking about. It means that they have more knowledge. The situation has changed. That sort of media communication, helping the public that, helping the public understand um, science as a, evolving practice that that wasn't adequately done by the government and that therefore independent sage stepped in to communicate that kind of a science as it as it develops under conditions of uncertainty okay so i think it's about time for me to move towards wrapping up so i'm gonna now uh, ask to skip the next two slides and come here so if we, if we don't assume fact versus non-fact, knowledge versus ignorance, science versus ignorance as our framework for approaching uh, the public contestation of knowledge, how then do we approach this? Now, the notion I am putting forward and developing is that of the public fact. So what is a public fact? A public fact is a knowledge claim that is unstable. So on the one hand, these are knowledge claims that have, I mean, they are articulate claims, um, but their truth value is disputed and also unstable. So their truth value may change over time. Now, I, I think that 
are COVID-19 vaccines safe or are GM crops safe? Question mark. Probably qualify as public facts of that nature. But I'd like to give you a different example just to see about how can this notion really work? And this is the claim that was made um, during the uh, campaigns for the, in prep, for the Brexit referendum, where the pro-Brexit campaign made the claim that the NHS was going, the National Health Service was going to receive 350 million pounds a week extra if Britain left the EU. Now, this claim was, um, well, it was, at the time, it was a false claim. Um, and indeed, the head of the UK Statistics Authority wrote a public letter um, declaring that this claim involved a clear misuse of official statistics. But what had happened, what happened once this claim was in circulation was that it was it, it got reformulated. So for instance, Simon Stevens, then the head of NHS England, took up this claim and reformulated it, arguing that it was crucial that 350 million pounds a week would be invested in the NHS, given the state of the health service. Um, and also the, the format of the claim was used by critics of Brexit. So um, this claim originally featured on a bus uh, and a different bus was uh, painted, uh, which toured the country with the statement, Brexit will cost 2000 million pounds a week. Now we see a claim here that on the one hand has features of being non-fact, uh, definitely in its early formulation, but it's also a claim that underwent a process of reformulation as part of which its truth value changed over time. And these are, I think, key features of public facts that they have a capacity to, for reformulation and in so doing can engage diverse publics with knowledge claims. So uh, next slide. So what I think is important is rather than falling back on distinctions between what is accepted as fact and what constitutes as its opposite, uh, so ignorance or non-fact, we need to develop a positive appreciation of the dynamism of public debate. So the claim about the 350 million of the NHS was modified really significant, underwent transformation over the months and the periods that followed. And in fact, it became from a claim about the EU, it became more and more a claim about the NHS. And that positive um, framing of how public debate can produce statements that in, that have more validity after a public process than before. That is, I think, a, a positive process that we really need to engage with. So now the last two slides. Um, so what, what kind of a distinction or what kind of an approach um, is entailed by this notion of public fact? Next slide. What it entails, I think, is that we go back to some older, older ideas about the relationship between science and ideology and the difference between science and ideology. The sociologist of knowledge, Norbert Elias, who, who worked for, for the last uh, two decades of his life in, in Amsterdam, uh, in the Netherlands, he speaks of what he calls the sliding scale between object and subject adequacy. So rather than a distinction between fact and non-fact, or a distinction that starkly opposes science on the other hand and ideology on the, on the one hand, he proposes that we get used to thinking about a continuum 
that we let go of all our all or nothing models and that we in de instead develop more differentiated models in which we can link non-scientific and scientific knowledge to each other and where we allow for different degrees of what he calls object or subject centeredness in our knowledge. So where science claims object centeredness, it's guided by objectivity. There are other forms of discourse that are guided by subject centeredness to express experience. And it's really important, I think, that with this kind of a conception, one can understand public debate as a space where both kinds of uh, knowledge, object centered, and subject-centered, or let, let's say both types of discourse, object-centered discourse and subject-centered discourse circulate. So developing an understanding of that is then really our task. And now I come to my very last slide and my conclusion, um, which is just really a summing up of the of the two of the three points that I that I've made, and uh, yeah, would like to to. Um, yeah, to, to leave with you. So the first is this distinction between contested and contentious knowledge um, and the possibility that we're seeing some shifts in emphasis uh, uh, between these two. Uh, so from, from a contestation of knowledge claims to a contestation about knowledge, where we need to move beyond the problem of uncertainty and complexity in public literacy but we need to recognize that expert disagreements are continuously at risk of being overshadowed by attacks on scientific orthodoxy. How to deal with that situation? I think, as I said, we need to really move beyond our familiar oppositions and come to terms with the reassertion of ideology in public debate. So what we are facing is contestation not, not just of knowledge, but of the relevance of truth to public debate and public decision making uh, and, and the conditions for, for ensuring that. Um, and so this is then also a wider contestation that um, scientists uh, and other uh, proponents of public knowledge are engaged in. So we're, we're engaged in a wider contestation about knowledge and that requires a different strategy. Um, then lastly, the, really the, the importance of, of the cultivation of a public knowledge culture, uh, which um, I think in, um, yeah, in previous decades was a very different kind of challenge. And that today uh, it, it becomes more and more important to affirm that facts can only be established as facts via a partly public process. And that that is not only uh, because of um, the sort of the, the incapacities or the underdeveloped uh, uh, talents of the public, but that that is really inherent to the process of the establishment of fact, uh, that they uh, get consolidated in a, in a process of public exchange. So the question then is how to cultivate the conditions for uh, um, the, the, the establishment of public facts. And so I offer this notion of alias of object adequacy. So how adequate are claims to the world um, as, uh, as a question that is posed alongside the question of how adequate are claims uh, to, to subjectivity, to experience. Um, yeah, that, that, that we develop strategies where we can recognize that uneasy coexistence uh, along, along that. Uh, sliding scale uh, of alias. So I leave it at that. <laughs>